Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, first of all, can I say uh, thank you to David for organizing this. Secondly, to say that um, I think we have had a thorough analysis of the alternative systems, and I think um, certainly from the rostrum, uh, there is only one answer, and that is that uh, we don't want to stay in the EU, certainly not in its present character, and the other is that we would prefer, uh, rather than stay in the EEA, to go into an EFTA-type arrangement of the kind, I have to say, which many of us have advocated for very, very many years, and which really uh, does provide an answer to most of the problems. But I would like to say one thing, and that is this, that the United Kingdom has got something of the order of getting on for soon 68, 69 million people. And that puts us, if I may say with great respect, to many of the countries that we uh, love and enjoy our relationship with in a different capacity. We also are embedded in the history of Europe, um, having been involved directly in saving Europe twice in the last hundred years. And we also, and we know now, outside the Euro, um, have actually got rather a goodish economy. I'm not going to say it's perfect, but I'm going to say it's getting a lot better. Unemployment is plummeting, etc. Now, the analysis we have heard, I think, can be fairly summed up by saying, and I say this as a person who has gradually, um, up to about four years ago, been moving towards exit and has now concluded that there is no alternative. I think there is no alternative simply because of the reasons I'm going to give that uh, treaty change of the kind that is being advocated by the Prime Minister uh, is simply not going to lead to the kind of structural changes that are needed or have been discussed in this room or, in my judgment, are really wanted by the voters of this country judging from opinion polls. It may be that multinationals and it may be that um, certain uh, banking institutions and others would like us to stay in, but I do not believe that that is the general sense of the British people. And when they are asked, do you want to stay in or get out, we are now getting to a point where more people, on the whole, are saying that they would rather go out. But the other question, which is, do you want a fundamental change in the relationship, produces a very, very much higher positive answer. In other words, they do want a fundamental change in the relationship. Turning the argument, therefore, to the government, or indeed to the Labour Party, or the Liberal Democrats, or to the European establishment and the institutions, when faced with the question, would you countenance the kind of treaty change that would be needed in order to achieve the fundamental change in the relationship, which the British people clearly do want on all present evidence, then that means that we would have to leave and that is the reason why I've come to the conclusion that there is no alternative but to campaign to come out because for the rest, it's not on offer. That is the key issue for us to grasp both politically and economically. Now, the bigger picture, I would say, is that we have only been in for 43 years as compared to the hundreds of years of evolving democracy and uh, the fight for freedom and the saving of Europe on those previous occasions. The bigger picture, too, is that the EU simply doesn't work. It's driven by ideology, and you only have to look at the Greek-German situation at the moment, which can be encapsulated by saying you obey the rules or you abandon what the, British, or the Greek people have decided. Now, that may be a rather stark way of putting it, but that's really what it boils down to. And the Germans are effectively, and indeed the EU are saying to the Greeks, you have got to do what we say. We've got a few days to go, but that is the present situation. But the very fact that it can be put in those terms is a demonstration of the chasm that has now grown up between the treaties themselves and the democratic problems that arise uh, when handling the issue within the EU. 
the EU is perversely going backwards from the original objectives post-1945, which I understand my father was killed in the war, got the military cross in Normandy. I can understand why people wouldn't want it to happen again. But the problem is that perversely we're going backwards. There is more nationalism, actually, now. There is also chaos. And there is less peace, less stability, less democracy, and I would argue also less of the rule of law. You only have to look at what is going on in the other countries to realize that that is not simply an assertion for which I was criticized in 1990 when I said this is what would happen and castigated for daring to oppose the Maastricht Treaty and leading the arguments in the House of Commons on so many issues. There is chaos in Europe, 60% youth unemployment, and implosion is either imminent or the alternative, if there isn't implosion, is going to be an irresponsible co coercion illustrated by the attitude towards the Greeks now. I would argue, actually, that both Greece and Germany are at fault. And I would also say so is the EU. But then I'd also say I think the EU bears a very heavy responsibility for what's going on in the Ukraine right now. Because actually it was the determination to take Ukraine within the ambit of the EU which was bound to provoke President Putin, whatever his motives, and I have no brief for Mr Putin, and I do not believe that many of the things that he's done are desirable. And I am appalled at what is going on in Donetsk. But I do also say that it is statesmanlike to make sure that you don't create the windows of opportunity. And I've just come back from Riga, which is where the Latvian presidency is taking place. I was there this last weekend and the weekend before. And the bottom line on that is that uh, I was spoke to a very senior, I won't give his name, it was a private meeting, uh, who said, of course we made a mistake when we suggested that Ukraine should become part of NATO in the Bucharest arrangements of, 19, uh, of, of, two, uh, of 2008 or nine. And the fact is that this provocation has led to a very serious problem and it was avoidable and I don't know what the answer is going to be and I'm not going to try to prescribe one now but it is a very critical situation and many people believe that the ceasefire will not hold. On balance, the EU is a failure and it, since the end of the 20th century Following the Cold War and the post-war period, the EU has reduced stability, prosperity and democracy, except in a few member states, such as, in particular, Germany. All over Europe, as I say, there are riots, protests, economic stability, and above all, or part of that fabric, is the failure of trust. The levels of distrust in Europe are now absolutely monumental. They're rising at 50, 60 percent in places like uh, Spain, Greece, Italy. And in fact, you could argue that in most of the countries where they say they want to stay in the EU, there is an identifiable link between the fact that they want the money to enable them to be able to get the advantages that they will derive from infrastructure and the rest of it, on the one hand, and in the case of the Baltic countries and Central Europe, or the eastern part of Europe anyway, I would say defence, because they are fearful of Russia, and no doubt for good reason. But the reality is that the EU is now discredited in the minds of the voters and the electorates, but it is not discredited at all in the minds of the ideologues in the Euro establishment and the institutions, nor, I would argue, is it discredited in many parts of Germany. What this is doing, in general, is generating political alienation, not merely against the EU, but because of its manifold applications in different parts of our economic and political performance, it is alienating people against politics itself on a monumental scale. So I believe that the EU is actually 
responsible for undermining trust in politics too. Because after all, when Acts of Parliament are passed in Westminster and they are not derived from what the voters have said they want, because they are imposed on us under the European Community Act 1972, there is a perfectly understandable reason why, for example, businessmen should feel alienated because they're having to apply regulations which do harm to their business, which don't allow them to grow. And this is the consequence of implementing legislation, much of which was decided by majority vote and quite often by consensus in Coripa, that is the um, civil servants who uh, make the decisions or at any rate provide the decisions for the Council of Ministers. And when you consider the manner in which uh, the majority voting system functions, remember also that on the 1st of November last year, the system was changed so that two countries, such as France and Germany, plus two smaller states, now have a blocking minority. And of course, by conversely, they can have a controlling influence at the same time. These are really fundamental questions. The voters are being disenfranchised. Those who fought for democracy in 1832, and most particularly in 1867 and subsequently, would be absolutely horrified to realize that we no longer run our own affairs, and that to the extent to which the sovereignty of the British people through their parliamentary representatives has been completely undermined. Furthermore, I would say a European Union, I emphasize Union, based on the evident domination of one main country, both within the Eurozone and the European framework as a whole, namely Germany, is emphatically the wrong structure. And as I've argued in Germany as well, not, not in the interests of Germany itself, nor in the rest of Europe, and most emphatically not for the United Kingdom. The effect of majority voting itself has now got to the pitch whereby the veto itself, which was promised in 1971, quite clearly, where it was stated, un un absolutely without any reservation, that it was absolutely essential to be retained in our national interest, and to deprive of us of the veto in the United Kingdom would also endanger the very fabric of the community itself. In other words, they understood that trying to create this compression chamber and not allowing anybody to say no would inevitably lead to the kind of implosion and the problems that we're now experiencing throughout Europe as a whole. And I would also add that regarding the question, which we have to face up to, that there is now a dominant element in the European Union in the form of Germany, it is not merely economic, it is also aggregate, in aggregate political as well. And the problem is this, that for the United Kingdom, we have a deficit with the 27 member states of over 50 billion, right? We have a surplus, as Ruth was saying, with the rest of the world. But we, the Germans have a surplus with the other 27 of over 50 billion, whereas we have a deficit. Now, if I was a trader, if I was a, a businessman, I wouldn't see that as a terrifically good deal. And I would also say that, in fact, the German balance of payments, which came out last week, seem to demonstrate that they have got a surplus with the rest of the world which has gone up from 195 billion to 215 billion in one year. That demonstrates the extent to which the deal within the framework of the Union is being distorted in, I think, a very, very deeply unsatisfactory manner. I would simply say that all political parties have, in fact, failed to grapple with this problem. And the trouble is that... Each of them is to blame, and there is only one answer, and that is to have a clear idea of where we want to go. I believe that the EFTA solution is the best answer. I think that you can combine that with the EEA light arrangements. 
the EEA in itself means you have to be part of the European frame, legal framework, and I don't think that that is practical or desirable. And therefore, we are being told that it is out of the question to have treaty change. We can discuss, no doubt, the implications of Article 50 later if it comes up in questions and so on. But I would simply say this, that we have to leave these treaties because the people of this country who fought and died to preserve our freedom and to save Europe have in fact left us with a legacy and a responsibility. It isn't just that it is a theory about liberty, it is actually about the practical application of ensuring that the United Kingdom and the people who live in it can vote for themselves. And I would say many of the other countries in Europe would follow us if we make the right decision. Thank you very much.